Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to Final Fantasy Bestiary. This series is dedicated towards discovering the history and lore behind Final Fantasy's most iconic creatures and characters. This episode will continue looking at another job in the franchise, this time looking at the Summoner. Summoners in Final Fantasy, and RPGs in general, stem from the act of evocation. This is the real-world term synonymous with summoning a supernatural entity such as a spirit or demon. Many religions throughout the world practice or at least speak about evocation in their texts, though many regularly use hallucinogens and other mind-altering substances as part of the ritual. In Final Fantasy, summoners are focused on one thing, summoning, as if you hadn't already figured that one out. They usually can collect a vast number of different summons with a variety of effects, such as elementally aspected damage, buffs, or debuffs. When fighting, summoners usually exchange a large amount of MP in exchange for calling forth these beasts a single time, meaning that their effects are usually quite devastating when used properly. Each different title gives these summons a different name, but the individual summons usually recur quite frequently in the series. In order to use these summons, they are either bought from shops or must be defeated in battle, sometimes as a plot device while other times as hidden bosses. The summoner job would first appear as one of the jobs featured in Final Fantasy III, the first game to introduce a job system that allowed players to change jobs after starting the game. Now, keep in mind that some summons actually appeared in games prior, for example, Bahamut was present in Final Fantasy I even though summoners were not, but the summoner job would be officially revealed in Final Fantasy III. In this title, there were two jobs affiliated with summoning actually, the Evoker from the Water Crystal and the Summoner from the Earth Crystal. Summoner was basically a stronger version of the Evoker, having higher stats and having the capability to call out their summon's most deadly attack. While fun to use, most players prefer to utilize other jobs more frequently as they provided many quote game-breaking unquote effects, but Summoner would make its mark here and move on to appear in future titles, pretty much all of them. Though no job system officially existed in Final Fantasy IV, there were characters that fit all the different archetypes of the many jobs in Final Fantasy III. In this title, an entire village of summoners existed, though all but a few are wiped out at the beginning of the game. The lone survivor of that particular village was Rydia, a female child who would eventually grow to be a powerful summoner that the party can utilize. Utilizing Idolins, this game's name for the summons, she was capable of dealing devastating damage. Little lore tidbit, technically summoners in the world of Final Fantasy IV die if their Idolin perishes in combat, as is explained very early on in the story. Final Fantasy V would return to the classic job system where Summoner is once again featured as a job earned after the Water Crystal shatters. The MP cost and magic attack of this job are among the highest in the game, meaning they can use their summons to great effect, though at a steep cost. One of the most popular summons in Final Fantasy V is actually a defensive one, the Golem. Obtained if you saved him in a random encounter, he grants a powerful shield against physical damage, making anyone with this effect invincible to any physical attacks. He is also relatively low cost for a summon in this game, so he is often used to render many enemies that lack magic attacks completely useless. Now, summoners would hardly be present in the series as a job for quite some time after Final Fantasy V, but the art of summoning, or evocation at this point, had become a staple the developers didn't want to let die, and I think that's for the better. In Final Fantasy VI, Espers, this game summons, were a cornerstone in character progression. You could basically equip them to learn spells and earn additional stats per level gained, and, of course, summon them in battle. This made staying low level throughout the game a serious benefit to any who could actually survive, as you could save all the levels until after obtaining several espers and then boost your character's power immensely. On top of this, espers and their power are pretty much central to the entire game's plot, with Kefka's ultimate goal to rule over all magic, including that of the three ultimate espers, the Warring Triad. Final Fantasy VII would have several summons present as materia that party members could equip to summon them in battle. It was pretty common to abuse summons in this game to help defeat many of the tougher bosses. The super bosses, Emerald Weapon and Ruby Weapon, are often defeated with a summon-centric strategy. After obtaining the double summon materia, allowing you to summon twice per turn, as well as the mime materia, which lets you copy the last action taken by your party, you could use those both to abuse and render these bosses pretty much relevant. For this strategy, Hades was usually used against Ruby Weapon as he inflicted stop on him so he couldn't counterattack. The other summon is Knights of the Round, a multi-hit summon that to this day is still one of the most popular summons in the entire series. This also began a trend of each game having a single summon with a ridiculously long summon animation, with Knights of the Round clocking in somewhere around a minute 20 to like a minute 23 seconds. Final Fantasy VIII would introduce summons as Guardian Forces, otherworldly beings that granted their users increased power at the cost of affecting their memory, which plays a role in the story. 
players could perform what was known as a junction to attach their guardian forces to the individual characters. This would allow them to access a series of commands and passive traits, as well as the ability to attach spells to their stats. This could be used to buff their strength or HP, enhance their attacks with elemental properties, or grant resistances to different debuffs. It's widely considered to be one of the most abusable character progression systems in any Final Fantasy, as you can basically use this to overpower your characters and render most of the bosses in the game helpless, especially if you keep your characters at low levels. Now, like we mentioned with Final Fantasy VII, which had begun the trend of summons having super long animations, Final Fantasy VIII has one of its own. Final Fantasy VIII's super long summon animation would come in the form of Eden, who was drawn from either the Ultima Weapon or Tiamat boss battles towards the end of the game. While Eden is not multi-hit like Knights of the Round, she is still capable of breaking the game's damage cap. Eden's summon animation is even longer than Knights of the Round, clocking it at a minimum of a minute and 29 seconds, but with using the boost feature, you could get her closer to like a minute and 46. Final Fantasy IX is another title with a story centric around its summons, once again called Eidolons. There used to be an entire race of summoners until they were mostly wiped out by Garland in an attack on their village before the game. Garnet and Aiko are the only two summoners you ever directly interact with, each of them having their own set of unique summons that they don't share with each other at all. Of them, Garnet possesses this game's super long summon, Ark. Compared to Knights of the Round and Eden, both of which could deal over 9,999 damage, Ark is much more lackluster as he can in no way multi-hit or break the damage cap. However, his animation is impressive, boasting a whopping 1 minute and 50-ish seconds for his animation. Final Fantasy X continued that trend of making summoning central to the story, this time with the entire plot revolving around the Aeons, this game's interpretation of summons. Summoners would pray at the temples to obtain the power of the Aeons until they were strong enough to obtain the final Aeon and defeat Sin, bringing about a temporary time of peace known as the Calm until Sin would be reborn. For this reason, the only character the player can play as permanently that has access to summons is Yuna. Unlike previous titles where summons perform a single attack and then vanish again, Aeons actually remain on the field after being summoned and basically act like a super-powered party member, though the player's normal party retreats while Yuna is controlling an Aeon. This makes them great for soaking life-threatening abilities or for wiping out bosses at no risk to the party. They can learn most of the game's normal spells and abilities and boast huge damage numbers to boost. Through enough training and unlocking celestial weapons for the party, all of this game's summons can break the damage cap at some point. Yojimbo even has a special attack called Zanmato, which can KO pretty much every boss in the game if you're lucky enough to trigger it. Now once again, this game's got some super long summon animations, but this one kind of works in a different way. First of all, there's two with pretty long animations, Anima and the Mage's Sisters, two secret summons in the game. Now keep in mind that when we're talking about their summon animation, they have an animation for actually being called into combat, and then you gain control of them like I mentioned earlier, and then you can initiate their ultimate attack. So we're going to actually be combining both their summon and their overdrive for this time frame. Now, Anima total animation for both his summon and his overdrive would clock in at about a minute and 14 seconds, not too big compared to some of the previous ones, while the Mage's Sisters total about a minute and 48 seconds. This includes both of their initial summon animations and the time it takes to perform their overdrives, but not the time in between, so keep that in mind. Final Fantasy XI would be the next game to host the summoner as a job again, releasing alongside the expansion pack Rise of Xylart. Summoners were unlocked after finding a carbuncle ruby within the inyards of a leech, then taking it across the world to have it drain the aspected energy of the different weather conditions. With all the elements absorbed, taking it to a special shrine in the Lathene Plateau would unlock Carbuncle, one of the five terrestrial avatars and the summoner's first pet. With this power, summoners would go on to master the power of the eight celestial avatars, all of which are commonly recurring summons from the series. Additionally, they would go on to master the power of two more terrestrial avatars, Diabolos and Fenrir, while facing off against the power of the remaining two, Bahamut and Phoenix. In the conclusion of Final Fantasy XI's story, known as Rhapsodies of Vanadiel, the Siren makes an appearance as the forgotten avatar and is central to the story. As for the job itself, summoners usually summon weaker versions of the avatars they master. Though weaker in lore, they can remain on the field so long as the summoner has MP to sustain them. They can also expend MP to both utilize powerful offensive and defensive skills, or simply leave them out to provide an AoE buff to the party. 
In the same vein as earlier titles, summoners are also able to unleash an ultimate attack, this time called an Astral Flow. Though for many years, this attack was actually considered inferior to certain other skills, as it completely drains the MP of the user. Some summons, such as Alexander and Odin, can only be used under the Astral Flow effect, basically performing their ultimate and then retreating like in the games prior to Final Fantasy X. Alexander's Mighty Guard in particular was one of the most abused abilities in the game when it launched, basically making the party nearly invincible for its duration. Final Fantasy XII would be up next, hosting a series of espers that function somewhat similarly to Final Fantasy X. After defeating an esper, players could learn the ability to summon them by mastering it on their license board. Now, in the original release of the game, espers had limited uses, though a few uses, you could use them to basically abuse game mechanics and bypass resistances enemies had to certain damage types, making them incredibly useful in those few scenarios. In the re-release, known as the IZJS, and the soon-to-be-released HD re-release, I should say, of Zodiac Age, they all received significant boosts or shifts in power, making them far more desirable in general. Final Fantasy XIII had summons play a central part of the game's plot, once again, with Eidolons appearing when a Lassie doubts themselves or their purpose to test them. If the Lassie fails the test, they die. If they succeed, the Eidolon grants the Lassie their power to use in combat. This is reflected in several battles throughout the game, where each party member eventually must face their Eidolon and each has their own mechanic to complete the encounter before the Doom counter falls to zero and kills the character. Once mastered, each character has their own Eidolon, which has a basic mode and a gestalt mode. In the basic mode, you basically fight alongside the Eidolon, while in Gestalt mode, you and the Eidolon are rendered invincible while you together unleash a series of deadly attacks. They are heavily abusable and strong, so learning to use them correctly can come in handy to the player a lot. The summoner job would once again appear in Final Fantasy XIV where it was added in the re-release of the MMO called A Realm Reborn. Summons in this game, known as Primals or Icons, are actually beings that drain the land of its ether, making them a natural threat to the world. Summoners instead channel a small portion of that power in the form of Eggies, a far less visually impressive version of their original form. They account for but a portion of the summoner's power, which is focused mostly in unaspected damage over time. However, summoners eventually are capable of channeling the power of Bahamut himself through their very body, unleashing his power through the Dreadworm Trance, and even using his Terror Flare ability as their limit break. And finally, we come to Final Fantasy XV, where the summons in this game come in the form of the Six Astrals. These six gods ruled over the world of man two millennia ago, until one of their own, Ifrit, brought about the Star Scourge to cleanse the world of humanity, whom he saw as parasites. The other five Astrals defeated Ifrit and gifted the power to absorb the Scourge to a man in the line of the Kings of Lucis. This act would grant the man immortality, but at the cost of being cut from the pages of history, thrown out of his kingdom, and shunned by the very gods he fought to assist. Two thousand years later, the chosen King Noctis would seek their power in an attempt to purge the planet of the Scourge and the immortal who absorbed it, Arden. There are a total of four summons Noctis can actually use in the game, though he can never summon more than once per battle. These four are Titan, Ramu, Leviathan, and Shiva. Unlike previous games where the player can manually choose to summon, summons here happen when the player is considered to be in a desperate situation, which can be triggered under a variety of different circumstances. When summoned, their damage scales with Noctis's level and will almost completely obliterate 99% of enemies in this game if he's a high enough level. Additionally, if playing on easy mode, Carbuncle is an additional summon that will be summoned when Noctis dies in most fights, resurrecting him with massive buffs. Now, as we say every week, of course, summons and summoners were in plenty of the off titles, and not all of them are mentioned here. I mean, it's just one of those things you guys pretty much expect with every bestiary. And I mean, summons are something we expect with pretty much every Final Fantasy title. Heck, RPGs in general, we just kind of expect them. I'm looking forward to seeing how summoners and their summons continue to be represented in the Final Fantasy franchise. And that's going to be a wrap for this episode of Final Fantasy Bestiary. Thank you again to our Patreon users for bringing the series back. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying it. I'm enjoying doing it as we wait especially for Final Fantasy XIV's next expansion, Stormblood. Anyway, thank you for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And stay tuned for the next one. Until then, take care.